moment in prayer as we give God thanks for Johnny Mercy. Can we can you labor with me in prayer as we give God thanks, give him praise, give him praise. Father, thank you, Lord Jesus. We exalt your name in Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed. We give you so much praise from the depth of our being for the great things that you are doing in our midst. We thank you for all the provisions that you have made available. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be exalted. You are good, you are kind, and you are merciful. We ask, O oh God, that during the course of this meeting today, that your spirit will inspire our hearts concerning the knowledge of your ways. And you cause everyone to be established therein. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say, Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. So you may have noticed the containers that are outside. And that's our cargo. Uh, the, the tent we ordered from China. That's the, uh, for the Abuja project. That's the tent. So much resources have been spent to secure that. Uh, so still referring to the Abuja audience, we are making serious progress. This is what has delayed us was delayed at the ports and all kinds of Satan himself rose up to frustrate our efforts. Um, a strange thing took place, which is not, which is something we cannot um, say online because of the sensitivity. You could see how that the devil was diligent to ensure that we did not succeed on the project. I believe with the Prince of Abuja that went there and manipulated so many things. But here we are, they, yeah. We were tracking the product all the way from China, and there were so many uh, places where tents were made, but the guys that made it for us have a reputation to be the best tent makers in China. In fact, the tent is a gallery tent. Have you ever seen that before? It has a gallery inside. So uh, I know you've not seen that. I, I, went, I went pretty much around Abuja, and I saw what they have. What we brought is not in Abuja. It's not there. So Satan was, um, I don't know. He went and stood. We tracked it from China. There was no problem. We tracked it to to Lagos, and the moment he arrived Lagos, that's when the problem started. So in this case, Satan was not in China. Satan left China, <laughs> left Europe, left America, and Satan was in Lagos. Before you travel to Lagos, pray, pray, because in this case, we found him right there. But we defeated him so many days of 24-hour intercession with all of the trouble that we had to do administratively, our tent has arrived. So what we are doing now is to um, sort out the issue of the land in Abuja where we are going to put the tent. So we are on top gear 
and we will bring um, more details when we have also surmounted that hurdle. So that any time you find yourself in the city of Abuja, and for those of you online, it, you, it will just a flight away to revival. If you want revival, just a flight away. We'll receive you in Abuja, and you will drink of that drink that is drink indeed, in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, since we started this ministry, Satan has never fought any project the way he has fought the Abuja mission. And it's interesting because we were taught in our basic discipleship that there are munitions that Satan uses against you, suggestive of what he is afraid of. So when you see him roll out his, his recent technology in warfare, against a certain project is an indication of the fact that that project is such a threat to him. So you should be motivated and mobilized when you see that Satan is fully mobilized to shut down a certain initiative. It is because he has evaluated the possible impact that that initiative is likely to have. So once again, we are committed to the Abuja project with with great tenacity, and uh, it shall be delivered in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, uh, in our absence, a few things have happened in my absence. The full report for the U.S. missions uh, will be ready by tomorrow, but I need to tell us that, yes, there, there's harvest, there's been harvest we've been experiencing Harvest in Makodi in different places, in Ghana, in Europe. The harvest that is available in the U.S., we have never seen it before. It's, the, it's something, something else. Something. <laughs> something else. You know, and uh, we were treated to a temperature of minus 12 degrees Celsius. Um, if you are not prepared for it, you just realize that you are just dying. Death itself has embraced you. So when you, you leave minus 12 and you come to, to Makodi here, you need to be very healthy to be able to go around. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, um, we've made some progress, and right now our focus is on the francophone nations, francophone nations. We've been doing anglophone all across, and uh, the francophone nations are on the front burner. In view of this, we want to announce our intention to be fully established in the nation of Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire. All right, that's our appointment for Côte d'Ivoire. Drami Alisi. And for all of you that are from Cote d'Ivoire, that's our man for the job. The contact numbers are displayed on the screen, and all nationals of Cote d'Ivoire, whether you are in London, in, in uh, Frankfurt, in France, contact Drami, be of assistance to him. And if you are in the nation of Cote d'Ivoire and you've been following us online, we are coming on ground. And uh, Rami will begin to prepare the atmosphere of the land for an apostolic invasion. We've, we've uh, not, uh, before this time, we, we, we didn't want to um, trouble ourselves with the Francophone nations. If I'm not mistaken, there are more Francophone nations in Africa than Anglophone. Reverend. OK, yeah. So there are more Francophone nations in Africa, if I'm not mistaken. You should know that now. So there are more Francophone nations. So if we decide to allow that language barrier to be a limitation, it means that our impact is going to be measured on the continent. And the mantle that the Lord has given us is an, Af an all-African mantle. So we have to take the courage and 
It's been a long journey that I cannot fully explain, but we have Rami for the nation of Cote d'Ivoire. Now, a lot of people from Cote d'Ivoire have been asking what do we have for their nation. This is the beginning of um, the process. We have Rami. Please support him. Please um, join with him and let us build God a tower of witness in the nation of Côte d'Ivoire. Hallelujah. Second notice is that our brethren in Scotland, they have bought their own building. Uh, Pastor Dan, can you check your phone? You are ready with Scotland? Okay, let's go to Netherlands first. Did I send you the pictures for Scotland? Woo! All right. So this is our point man for, for the Netherlands. Yes, and the phone number to contact is on display on the screen. For a long time, we were jittery about empowering a female point man. It, it took courage for us to. But the reason why the courage was not so difficult to afford is because of um, what I saw a lady do. Our point man of Botswana is a, is a lady, unassuming. I went and saw what she did from that day. And meanwhile, in the scriptures, uh, I think I need to show us in the book of Romans, uh, where Apostle Paul was talking about several people that need, we need to salute. Say, greet Apelles. Greet Junia. When he spoke about Junia, he said she was notable among the apostles. Junia was an apostle, but a lady. And the Bible says that she was notable. For Apostle Paul to say a lady was notable among the apostles. And he's suggestive of the fact that in terms of rank, in terms of capacity, she was in no wise inferior to any of the apostles that were around at the time. It's on the strength of that that we found some courage, some courage. And uh, so that's our point, man, for the Netherlands. And they, are, they, got, they got a venue in Den Haag, where the international, is it International Criminal Court? Okay, yeah, so, all right. So that's, that's, that's the address for the location. And uh, they are beginning with 10 hours prayer on the 4th of May at Den Haag. Mercure Hotel Den Haag. So please, if you are in or around the Netherlands, join yourself to that chariot. We are trusting God to set up an altar there. And when the altar begins to release sparks of illumination, we will trace it and build God a mighty name in those lands. So Netherlands, that's your point, man. Sister Abies is the point man for Netherlands. And the platform is situated in the city of Den Hague. Dan Haig. Um, Pastor Dan, do you have any update on the? All right, so Pastor Dan, you just link, reach out to Pastor Dennis in Scotland and let him send pictures of the cathedral. We've been trying to get a building to buy buildings to buy preferably old church buildings in the United Kingdom, and we have not been very fortunate. It's as if uh, the people responsible for the sales of these buildings prefer other people than ourselves. 
So we've bidded, we've done all kinds of things to get an opportunity to buy one of the buildings. And in fact, there was one fine one. And I was almost confident that we'll get it, uh, but we were not good enough. So the Lord saw our cry and he led the team to this current place. And um, before they put the building on the market, our people reached out to them with a very powerful letter. The letter had the anointing on it. There was an anointing on the letter. And when the letter was read to the hearing of the decision makers, they gave us the opportunity to buy the place. Um, you see, the reason why I will not mention the amount is because it might be the reason of heart attack, reason for heart attack for a lot of individuals in this um, immediate audience. Uh, because it's quoted in pounds. And um, only God can do such miracles. <laughs> uh, so somehow, I don't know, maybe the people from Scotland, when they come for IEC, they'll be able to tell the testimony of, now I insist that we, you see this building. Uh, uh, Pastor, give me my cell phone. I insist. So it, it has a main hall. It has children hall. It has all kinds of facilities. And uh, Oh, you have a video? Okay. Let's see. Let's see what you can do with your video. Well, we'll get other pictures, but I just want you to be aware of what God is doing. On a daily basis, we are marching forward. On a daily basis. 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 So we are, as we wait for the video, you know, we also went to Lagos to commission their own building. How many of you saw it? The forge, the forge. They have, um, I think we bought that land for 200 million. The thing about Lagos is land is like blood. To get land in Lagos is like shedding blood. So we're able to get that facility and um, we inaugurated it and mentioned the name of Jesus over it. It was humbling because that was the same city. We were holding prayer meetings in a certain house, and the neighbors of the person in whose house we were holding the prayer had reported him to the authorities that uh, it was supposed to be a residential location, and they were hearing some incantations. And there was a man that was bent on ensuring that we, we suffer loss. But in spite of that man today, the Lord has given us a massive location. The certificate of occupancy just came out. Just came out. Just came out. Uh, so we are in full possession of the place. Um, a hall. It used to, yeah, so this is Scotland. When you come to Scotland, oh, oh men and brethren, this is where we are going to be holding our meetings. Yeah, so that's the, that's the building. But it's on, undergoing very fantastic uh, renovations as we speak, uh, but this is the environment. And one thing about the United Kingdom is that you need to have your own parking area because whether or not some people will come is dependent on the availability of parking. The good thing about this, our little enclave, is that there are a lot of parking opportunities. So, well, I know parking is not an issue here, but over there, you pay for parking. 
when you park your car somewhere, you pay for it. So we have a very big compound, as you can see. Uh, that's all the way in the city of Glasgow, Scotland. So we are the owner of that building. Like I said, I don't want to mention how many pounds, but it's in the thousands. It's the hundreds of thousands of pounds. Not Naira, not Ghana cities, hundreds of thousands of great British pounds. So the Lord gave us that building for the purpose of revival. Every single day, is, we cannot fully articulate. God is, oh my God, someone needs to give him glory. So that's our place in Scotland. If you find yourself in Scotland, okay, okay, we are going to have a look. That's the inside. Now they are doing some renovations there. It's, it's better than what you are seeing now. It's better than what you're seeing now. Some, so that's the inside. That's the main church auditorium. Then you now have this space. We can do children here, and um, the children ministry can take place here. We have stores. Okay, so we, we did not only take possession of the building, but also the furniture that, that was in existence. So this is another place. You know, so we have a lot of space, a lot of overflow um, possibilities. These are toilets. It's a female toilet, or male toilet. And everything is in working condition, is in perfect condition. This is a female toilet. Everything in perfect working order. Um, what else do they have in the building? So this... Yes, yes. Their buildings are very, very um, comprehensive. They're not like ours. Uh, very comprehensive. Very comprehensive. So this is a kitchen. If you are doing any public thing, there must be a kitchen. There must be a kitchen. I know for most of you that are revivalists, it's also put a shade and you're blasting. You will need a kitchen. <laughs> then we have, okay, you can see all the spaces. It's a very functional uh, building, very functional building. In fact, I don't know how the brethren raised that amount of money, that amount of money. It's very difficult for you to earn a pound in the United Kingdom, very difficult to make a pound. But we were able to come up with hundreds, not 100,000, but hundreds of thousands of pounds. So this is the main auditorium. If you find yourself in Scotland in the month of June, navigate to this building, because we are going to set a fire here uh, that will last the test of time. So that's a baptistry for people that need to be baptized. And you can see the dance steps of the sister right there. Can we give the Lord a shout for this? <laughs> so tomorrow I will bring the update on the United States mission. And I must tell you, there's been no mission field that, that we have visited that has as much potential as the mission to the United States of America. Now, the reason why I took time to give you all these details is because of the subject that we are attempting during the course of these days, the call of God. Let us pray. Father, I ask that you read on your word and make it live. In the name of Jesus, bring understanding to the simple during the course 
of our discussions and place a burden on the hearts of your people. In Jesus' mighty name. Genesis chapter 12, beginning from verse 1. I'd like us to look on the symptoms of a call. And it is critical for us to begin to emphasize on this subject so that we will know how serious the issue of a calling is. And for every single believer, there is a requirement that heaven places upon you to achieve something in the interest of the kingdom of God. And you must not trivialize this emphasis of the Spirit of God. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I would like us to do an analysis of this call that God was given unto Abraham. Do an, an analysis of this call. The first thing I would like you to see here is that the subject of the call is nationhood. Nationhood. You know, we are talking about the symptoms of a calling. A calling has, it's not every encounter that you have with God that is a calling. But if it is a calling, it should have some symptoms. Some symptoms. A call must have an objective. There is something God wants to achieve, and you are part of the administrative infrastructure that is required for the achievement of that which is sustained on the heart of God. So there is a goal to a call. There is an object to a call. There is a circumference to a call, to a call. And for Abraham, we see that what God wanted to achieve was a nation. He called it a great nation. So God wanted to achieve a nation. God wanted to have a people that he could call his own. God wanted to have a people upon the face of the earth. So you'll be amazed how that God, in keeping with his desire to have a nation, now consulted with a man. I, in my own opinion, I would have expected that God would have called the community together and discussed with the community that, you know, I want a nation. Can you guys volunteer to become the first part of the nucleus of the nation that I intend to build? The objective was nationhood, but God consulted with a man. Do you see that there is nothing God wants to do in the earth that God does not capture in a calling that he gives a man? If God wants to do anything upon the face of the earth, he captures that thing which he wants to do. And then he, he, that thing which he wants to do becomes the basis upon which he gives a man a calling. God will not do anything on the earth without a calling. So the first thing, the first symptom of the call is that a call must have an objective. There is something that God wants to achieve. You know, I told you not every encounter that you receive that is a call. But every call that you receive comes by way of encounter. And what makes it a call, what makes that encounter a call is that it reveals an objective that God wants to achieve. Are you there? It reveals an objective that God wants to achieve. So the first thing we need to ask in the encounter is, 
Is God attempting to achieve anything? Or what is God attempting to achieve? Because it is that which God is attempting to achieve that becomes the platform upon which you become implicated to be part of the arrangement that God is making. Just like I said, God does not do anything without calling a man. If God really gets ready to do something upon the face of the earth, what he does is that he calls a man. So there's an objective that God wants to achieve, and your calling must capture the objective. If you've been having encounters, series of encounters, similar encounters, and you have not yet been able to decode the objective that God wants to achieve, it means that you are still in need of more encounters before it can be regarded as a calling. All right? It is a calling when there is an objective that God wants to achieve that implicates you as a person. The second thing that the calling must have is a location. We are not... We are not utopian. We are not suspended in the air. We don't dwell in the moon. So a call must carry a location. If you read Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show you. You cannot fulfill a call you receive from God just anywhere. There is a specific location that you will need to be in order for that calling to be in view. That location can be a church. That location can be a ministry. That location can be a family. That location can be a nation. That location can be a territory. But every call is location specific. For instance, if God's will for you is to be in RCN, and you find an equally wonderful ministry, and you are there, you have violated the law of location. And it is very likely that God may stop talking about the calling because you are disaligned. The day you decide to restitute that position and you come into the location that God has ordained for you to be, then he now continues to talk about the matter. The issue about obeying God, staying where God has placed you, functioning where God has placed you, is this. God cannot walk in every location. As touching your life, there is a specific location that you need to be if the agenda of God for your life is going to prosper. So the second thing about a call, the second symptom of a call is that it is location-specific. Now, um, Pastor Tony, can you pick the mic and come on? Meanwhile, I did not inform him that I will call you. You know, all those things I do here, I don't give the people prior. You know why they don't need prior notice? What's your name, sister? Yeah. Give me a short form. The name is long. Comfort. Comfort. Now, if I called you to the stage now and I give you the microphone and I ask you to talk about yourself, you don't need to prepare. Talk about yourself. You can tell us the primary school you attended, the secondary school. You can mention a few names of people that were your friends in primary school, in secondary school, in the university, because you're talking about yourself. Your spiritual self, the epicenter of your spiritual self is your calling. So if we call you to talk about your calling, that's your spiritual reality. 
That's what God made you alive to understand in the spirit that this is your lot and this is your portion. It is critical. And that's why we don't need prior notice. Now, so, uh, what did God do to you that made you know that you were supposed to follow me? Because, let me tell you, those days, there were people, those days on campus, were, were, you, you, were you on campus when I was there? No. No, he wasn't there. Those are the young men. We were, we've been. Uh, <laughs> all right, so she did not even have the opportunity to meet me on campus. At, at what point did you meet me and what convinced you that you were supposed to walk with me? Because there is a place for a call. A call doesn't exist in a vacuum. There is, and you see, this place matter is critical because not everybody has a pioneering calling. Many more people, 80%, only 20% of individuals in the body of Christ have the privilege to serve God in pioneering capacity. And I must tell you as a pioneer that I did not desire to be a pioneer because life is more difficult for a pioneer. The only reason why you should accept the call of a pioneer, the labor of a pioneer, is that you have the calling to be a pioneer. A calling to be a pioneer is going to expose you, to expose your family, to expose your children. It will put you on the edge. It's better for you to serve God under an existing pioneer. It's easier. All right, so this is not what I chose. I did not choose to be a pioneer. I did not choose it. But I'm going to tell you my own story. Now, so this is Tony. We never met in the university. At what point did you become convinced that you were supposed to follow me? Um, praise the Lord. Thank you very much, sir. For now, don't forget that the land, are you there? The land of your calling is not of your own choosing. You say, I'm going to send you to a land that I will show you. It's not something you conceive by your own human wisdom. You must be shown the land. And that's the second symptom of a calling. Yes? Over to you, Pastor Thank Tony. you very much, sir. Yeah. I think um, it, the main crisis for me began in my final year when I was... Now, I told you people, whenever you come up here, don't... don't yeah. I, I became the president of a campus fellowship, and um, I felt that there was something really missing in uh, the progression of God's working in my life. And um, I've watched Evangelist Gabi Todo. He has been a minister of campus for quite some time. And uh, I met him, and I told him I wanted to come under his discipleship to learn from him. Okay. It was at his instance that I got invited to uh, the first contact that was had at Just Taka Foundation. Oh, you were there? The very first day. Wow. Well. Well, there I'm was something that happened. Now. Okay, there was something that happened. Um, before now, I read the Bible a lot. But when I got to that meeting, um, what I can say was a, a, a voice, the voice of the shepherd was what I heard when I heard you preached. Okay. It became clear that um, I couldn't really place it, but the scriptures I know, I saw constructions being made with the truths I already have, and it was a hard connection for me at that time. Now, the reason for this testimony is, is so that you can understand the experience. You know, when we are reading the Bible and teaching the Bible, it is very intellectual. Most of us understand it from the mind. But in the execution of the plans and the purposes of God, you know the will of God in your heart. It's not... It's not an intellectual enterprise. It's an experiential enterprise. The things that happen to you that amount to the full knowledge of the fact that God has called you is experiential. So when he got to the place, 
Yes, so many things happened. But you know, he wasn't talking about the opening prayer because his experience did not come from that. Are you safe what I'm talking about? He did not talk about the praise and worship, and I believe there was praise and worship. There were people singing something, beating drums. His experience didn't come from that. And meanwhile, Jesus is always looking for an opportunity to reveal himself. He can be revealed in worship. He can be revealed in prayer. There are several people that came here. It was the prayer aspect of the meeting that they got their own encounter with God. So God will be looking for an opportunity to reveal himself. That's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But the, the, the revealing took place, the unveiling took place while the message was going on. And if you ask me what message, I don't remember because I'm not involved in, in what led to his encounter. I was just preaching the scripture that I felt the Lord has laid on my heart, and God used that as an opportunity to reveal himself in such a way that made that impression, that impact on his heart. And when the impact was made, he could see himself in the tribe. It's experiential, not intellectual. What I'm explaining is intellectual. You're holding it in your brain. But that's not how it plays out. It plays out experientially. I want you to take time to describe your experience again before I let you off the hook. You know, so that day I was there, it looked like a thousand messages were preached in a moment, and um, I couldn't cram them, but I knew my heart was being ministered, was being ministered to, and then uh, eventually I got the opportunity to come close to this man that, <laughs> it was a dread. Yes, the preacher that they used to, you know, a lot of people believe that when you see me on the pulpit preaching, especially when I bloody, you would think that I'm a hard man. So, until you have the opportunity to meet me on the ground. So, what was your experience when you came, you met the man, the man shouting on the pulpit? You know, when, when I came really close, it was another hard crisis moment because the simplicity was, was something else altogether. We'll be in Abosu's apostle's house. There was one rule there, if you eat, wash your plates. And everybody, the kitchen was, it was, they, they, he was so open and simple that um, I wanted to be like him. And there were other personal time I had with him that got me really thinking. One of those times, we were sitting on your car outside of uh, that um, drug law house. And you asked me a question that really was humbling for me. You said, Tony, if you notice I'm doing something wrong, will you have the boldness to tell me? And I said, yes. And then he said, now you accept me, you are safe with me. And um, it was something that really was a very turning moment. And um, there were points where I got specific instruction. During my NYC, I was really involved in um, RCM before I went for service. And the normal thing that happened in my family is if you go for service, don't come back home so that you don't, your family just let them feel that you are, you, are, you are making progress. And I was really ready to stay back in Nemo State, and the Lord told me to come back to Benue State. You know, I said there is a location. Now, a lot of people are doing the things God wants them to do, but unfortunately, they are doing it in the wrong location. And you, it means you are not doing it for God. You are going to struggle. God is not aware that you are there. And what you claim you are doing, uh, you are on your own. Location is critical. A pastor came to see me in my office for counseling. And he said that, I am convinced the Lord has called me to pioneer a ministry. I said, bless God, praise God. And uh, that because I was so convinced, I resigned from the ministry that I was working with. I, oh my God, praise God. Then I asked him, where is the location of this ministry? He said he doesn't know yet. Now, so he went as far as re resignation. When he was not clear 
on the location that God wanted him to go. You, 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 you guys don't know God. Eh? It, can take him, it can take God five years to tell you the location. Uh, please help me preach your name, but God is in a hurry. But he's in, not in a hurry with you. <laughs> he wants to smuggle revival into the land. He's in a hurry. He's trying to do something. But for, with you, he's not in a hurry. So, this guy took off like a tornado. God is so meticulous. And he has, he has his own timing for everything. So it gave you an insight that, okay, yes, there's a pioneering call. But you became smart and felt that you were smarter than God, that you should, uh -uh, it should be Abuja now. It's Abuja. The difference between a pioneer and a non-pioneer is this. If you are not a pioneer and you enter into an existing ministry, it means that God is giving the leadership of that ministry the responsibility of determining your location. That's part of the package that God had in mind before he allocated you into that mission. Okay? But if you are going to pioneer, you must understand that you will need to know what he wants you to do. You also need to know where he wants you to do it. So you were convinced that you were to follow me. You were in Imo State trying to arrange your accounting pro. <laughs> he was trying to settle his life there. And what exactly did God tell you that made you come back? He said, back? come back to Benue State and work among the youths. So I spent six months praying. And then I started having dreams where you will give me an assignment to pray for somebody in the dreams, in the visions of the night. And on, in one of those uh, dreams, when I began to engage the assignment you gave me, a wind came and carried me from the ground. And as, as I was being elevated by the wind, I was hearing years, 2010, 2011, 2012, and it was counting as all of that will happen. So it informed my philosophy of assignments, duties, and responsibilities. Received this conviction, me and him were already friends. Yes, we we're already close friends. So and he now came back from his youth service and told me now that the relationship has changed, that he's no longer friends. We are not friends. You see, it's a difficult, if it's a very serious matter for you to call somebody your, I'm your father in the Lord. In my own opinion, I believe it's a big matter. Even if that is the case, when I'm speaking in the public, I say, one of my friends are here, is here, some of my friends are here. I'm more comfortable with that kind of description. Because, you know, I know a preacher that cannot preach for 35 minutes before, without saying one of my son, you know, my son there, my son here, <laughs> my son, my son. If you know what this matter is, you will not be quick to to be saying such things. You will not be quick to be saying such things. So he came back from Imo State and said the relationship has changed. God has given instruction to follow. I've heard that many times. So whenever I hear it, I don't believe it. The only way I believe it is if over time your actions does not contradict what you told me. It can be two years. It can be four years until, because it's God that told you to follow me, until God now tells me that I sent him to follow you. Sometimes it can be two years, sometimes it can be three years. We'll still be, I will not believe you. <laughs> A two cannot work together except they be agreed. When God now bears witness with my spirit, then I will now place you. That waiting period, maybe he came and then it took two years before he was placed. How many years did it take? From, it took two years from 2007 to 2009. Okay, two years. The major disruption. Now, let me tell you something. Within that two years, many people that came, between the two years or three years, as the case may be, for confirmation to be established, 
they change their mind. So you will know that God did not send this one. Now, when we were much younger, I had not married my wife yet. One of my friends came to me with a lady who was dating and said, God had spoken to them that when they get married, that they don't have a pioneering calling, that they were going to be part of what God will use me to do. I, I know them. They don't like prayer. So I now told him, I told them that this thing means you people need to adjust to. Are you with me? Because the, the major fabric of what we are called to do has to do with intercession. And the guy was so allergic to prayer. You know, I, I, was, I, I served in Kano. And their family house was in Kano. So when we hold those meetings, when we pray for money to evening, he will come in the morning. He will pray for 30 minutes and say, he has something in Sabongeri. Yeah. For the whole number of years I was there, he was always having something in Sabongeri. There was something in Sabongeri. There's something in, in Brigade. He never finished one prayer meeting with us. Now they had come to me and said the Lord had led them. I said, well, I need to be frank with you. You know my lifestyle in terms of devotions and all of that. And I've not seen that level of coming. Can you, can you endure? Can you? Because ministry, if we say we want to do ministries, we are sold out. They say, no, they know. They were just. Yes. Ah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh. Four years later, they came back to me again. I said, God spoke. And the Lord said they should start a church in a certain city. I said, ah, great. Because I knew that they would not be able to cope. No, sincerely, I knew they would not cope. Then I now came to Makodi. We now started. Started this ministry. So the church that they started, one of the workers in that church, his relative came to visit him. So he told the person, I'll be in church when you come into the city, to come to the church. That is relative that went to visit that church, knows me. So when he came, he saw it was a serious workers' meeting. So he sat at the back. This same pastor that said to me those days that God has asked them to come and work under me. His church members now asked him, there was a time you were close to this man. What happened? This guy that came from the village, he was listening. Okay. The guy said that me, I wanted him to be his assistant pastor. So he refused. That's the reason why I stopped talking to him. See me see Wahala. <laughs> this other guy that came from the village heard it and came out and was wondering and then made contacts and said, see what, the, is this what happened? I didn't feel there was any need to explain to him. I said, let the will of God be done. The same person took my name to another minister of the gospel, lied to him. When we now met at the airport, he knew that maybe if I engage that minister, the truth will come out. So he came and distracted everybody. Hey, 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 hey. Distracted. I didn't know what he was doing. Are you there? This other minister that he went to tell all these things now went to preach somewhere in a congregation like this and saw a young guy and called him, asked him to stand up during his administration. That is there any minister of the gospel in this country that can tell you stand here and you will stand? He said, yes. He now mentioned my name. That minister now became angry. This minister that is angry is angry because the other minister had told him about me in a negative light. Are you there? And then he now started saying, these small boys that call themselves uh, apostles, 
The moment he said that, the people in the meeting left. He only had like 20 people. Are you still following me? When I and my wife were now traveling to Lagos, we were in the business class cabin with this minister that spoke. He doesn't, that's when we discovered he doesn't know how I look like. But he had spoken about me because of Many years later, you know, God doesn't act quickly. This calling, you know what they call calling? It fights people. Calling. Many, many years later, it became clear that God did not choose him. What is going to differentiate you with the next person? Calling. So this matter is a serious matter. I've seen people rise and fall just because of calling. If it is true, if the guy had followed me as, as if he said, we would have had problem here. Because these ones, these guys that you are seeing, they are men of God. These ones are men of God. We would have had, pro you know, God, hey, Jesus Christ, God delivered me from evil. So, these are the real people he brought, not that one. And more than 10 years ago has proven it. You can call yourself and start something. Initially, it might even look that as if something is happening. It's after 10 years, it will be clear that there is no call from God that is behind it. God will help you waste your time. So on the issue of a calling, you must be sure the location God is deploying you. Because it's going to shape your future. When you came, did you know we'll be standing on a platform like this? <laughs> it was unimaginable. So that's the third point, the third symptom. And I will bless thee. There is a guarantee. Yes, you are released. Thank you, sir. There is a guarantee that God will bless you. <laughs> there is a guarantee that God will bless you in a calling. If it is true that God has called you, then there is a guarantee that you are going to be blessed in the calling. I was taking a look of, of how much money we spend on tickets in a year. If you are not strong in your heart and you see that, those, those, those figures, the blood pressure might go up. But all of those resources came from where? The calling. Today we are building a hospital. Today alone, 48 million has been withdrawn to buy equipment for this hospital. God said we were going to have an apostolic coordination center in the city of Makodi. He made it happen. He said we were going to have a television station. He made it happen. Are you there? He said we were going to have um, international missions. These things I'm telling you, he spoke in 2005, 25th of July. We just wrote it on his piece of paper. That paper that Pastor Dan now found, I don't know where he got it from. When you check that paper, you will see that everything that God said we were going to do, we were doing it. And that was phase one. We have finished phase one. Everything in phase one has happened. Then God started with phase two. It's in phase two that this hospital was captured. In phase two, there is a day secondary school that is in phase two. 
That one has not happened, but you will see it happen. In phase two, international missions became part of phase two. The first pilot nations were South Africa, Ghana, and the United Kingdom. How many of you watch our Ghana people on Facebook? Have you seen our Ghana people on Facebook? Ghana. They, if you have not visited our South African branch, you don't know worship. When those guys begin to work, you know I've gone to 70% of our branches, not 100%, but 70%. There is no branch among our ranks that knows worship like South Africa. If you go there, you won't come back. You will just ask them to look for a place. <laughs> Jesus! Pilot centers were United Kingdom, South Africa, and Ghana. You were all here when I announced it, before it started happening. God has opened all of that. Phase two, if we finish this hospital, we have finished phase two. Now it's phase three. He said, I will bless you. I will what? So the question is this. Whether or not you become blessed is determined by how faithful you are in the placement of your calling. If there is a lack of faithfulness in the placement of your calling, it will affect your blessing. It will affect your blessing. If there is faithfulness in the placement of your calling, God is going to bless you. So the third symptom of a calling is that one of the ways you know you are in alignment in a calling is the blessing that accompanies it. You begin to see God going out of his ways to make provisions available to fund that intent of his that he has committed to you. Even when we started, we never lacked money to do the thing God called us to do. And I can tell you confidently that the expenditure per month when we started was 100,000. In 100,000, if we have 100,000, we can run the ministry for one month. So, those of us that were working class made the 100,000 naira available. We were running. I don't want to. Okay, let me tell you the real matter. It was in the place of prayer. The Lord spoke to me and said, we should give him 100,000 every month, me and my wife. So when we give, if we give this 100,000, it means that our car should not get spoiled and nobody should fall sick. Because if any of the above happens, we will not have what it takes to go through the month. We have accepted to give God the 100,000. That 100,000 was sufficient to take care of the ministry in one month. Are you there? So, when we started giving this 100,000, one month after we started giving the 100,000, my executive from the city of Abuja came to visit our depot. And when they came to visit our depot, we had interactions, we had, yes, we had interactions. They asked for pandediam, I took them where to eat pandediam. And then they went back. When they went back, our chief executive asked that they should bring my fire. They had denied me promotion for four years. And when they brought my fire, the man looked at my fire and saw that I'd been denied promotion. He called the head of admin and asked him to give me all my promotions and restore my status to what I'm supposed to be. 
and pay me all the arrears. I just gave the 100,000 for one month. Are you there? The man they called to change the records was a man that vowed to me that I will never be promoted. Was the same man that they summoned and gave a directive to effect my promotion. Promotions come out in January, but that my own promotion came out that day in June. It was backdated. Are you there? So the next year I became eligible for the next promotion. It was back. The money that I used to build that my house is that the areas of that promotion that they gave me that I used to build that house. And then because of the promotion, my salary increased. So even though someone falls sick or the car has problem, in spite of the 100,000 we gave, we had enough money to take care of ourselves. Are you, are you following me? You are not following me. You are not following me. I'm, I'm telling you real life issues so that you will know that if it is a call we are committing to, there must be a blessing. Don't hear any other story otherwise. When you see somebody claiming to be attending to a call and you don't see signs of God's commitment, ask him, are you, did I call you? No, that, you are not with me, you are not. Did, did they ask you to do what you are doing? You, the other day in my village, somebody came and said, he saw, as he was all and about the calling, he saw Satan with a fork flying and said, when he finished telling the story, I said, is it true that you were called to do this thing? Because we are doing more dangerous things than you are doing, but we have not seen Satan fly. We have seen, instead, we have seen God's faithfulness push us forward push us forward in a way that we know that he's the one that is at work. He said, I will bless you. It's not as if you prayed for it. Blessing becomes the consequence of aligning to the calling. He didn't say, okay, now that I've called you, you will labor in prayer. Then I, No, he said, I will. What? Yes. Guess what happened? The next year, I was eligible for promotion again. The man went and brought my file. He asked for the file again. So the next year, I was promoted. So I had two promotions in two years. And that was how my status was restored. I was flying in the ranks. And I never missed a promotion again until I resigned. Never missed it again until I resigned. As at the time I resigned, the ministry did not need my support to survive. The ministry had found its footing and the oasis of grace had attracted sufficient resources to keep the ministry standing without my own impute. Are you there? So I stepped out on the orders of Jesus. I did not step out, step out because we became comfortable as a ministry. I stepped out on the orders of Jesus. And when I stepped out on the orders of Jesus, I was wondering how to feed because there were people that God had given to me to take care of. And when he asked me to stop work, he did not ask the people to leave. So I went to him in prayer and fasting and said, okay, you asked me to stop work. My last salary was 1.2 million. Naira every month. And that is exclusive of my allowances. That's my basic salary. My housing allowance at that time was 15 million a year. And you know, there's no house that I rent in Makoti for 15 million. I feel like you need to be mad to resign from that job. You need to be mad. If I had waited and be become a management staff, my housing would have been 19 million a year. And by monthly, you have allowances in addition to the 1.2 million. I could buy a car any month of my choosing. And Jesus said, step aside. You know, those days we felt that the best thing that happened to us was the job that we were doing. 
that there's no... Yes, in the Nigerian context, I was earning the salary of a brigadier general. Yes. As at the time of my resignation. It was foolishness to say you want to resign. But you see, the things of God look like foolishness in the eyes of men. It was on the orders of Jesus that I stepped aside. And when I stepped aside, I went to Jesus for prayers. And I said, you asked me to leave the job. You did not ask the inhabitants to leave the house. So what arrangement do you have for upkeep of this great house? You know what he told me? Teach the Bible. Teach the Bible. I was wondering how teach the Bible was going to be a solution to my practical problems. I was doubting that his answer until one day I did a teaching. And then people began to give me, send money to my account with Zenith Bank. I came from church, then we were not here yet, we were in the old place. I came from church and drove home. When I got home, I opened my phone. The alert that came on my phone that night was equivalent to my previous one month salary, 1.2 million. So he gave me what I used to earn in a month. He gave me that same amount, exact amount, in one day from teaching the scripture. Then I knew that that strategy that God had given could sustain me. I had no doubt in my heart. No doubt. 1.2 million. I said, in one day? You know, it was big. <laughs> I give more than that almost on a daily basis now. As you are seeing me, ask Pastor Dan, we were talking today. It's an easy thing for me to empty my account if Jesus has spoken to me. My contribution to this building was 70 million. After giving that 70 million, my financial status changed. I don't need to preach for people to give me. And that's why I don't accept an invitation that Jesus, you can, what, I will, what I will get staying behind this pulpit and teaching, nobody can give me. I've seen that. I know this practically. What I stay here preaching, what comes to me? I have not gone for any meeting where anybody was able to give me. If you see me accept an invitation, God has sent me. God has sent me. There's no place I like more than the city called my according. No place. My bones will begin to ache. I know that the bones are aching for the city of Macau. The moment I see the bridge, fresh life comes upon me. <laughs> so when I entered yesterday night, fresh life, fresh life came upon me. There's no, no honorarium prophet offering that I'm giving anywhere that is likened unto what? When I finished teaching, somebody somewhere is touched. Sometimes I want, I ask my wife, where is this money coming from? Before I sleep to wake up, God has told me the people to send the money to. Sometimes in the dream. In the month of January, he will not stop asking me to give. This month, before the Spirit of God could allow me rest, I had given 15 million. That's when he now allowed me rest. In the kingdom of God, giving is a big thing. Please help me tell your neighbor. In the kingdom of God, giving is a big thing. It's a big thing.
So there was no need for the inhabitants of the house to go. There was no need. Because if you are fulfilling the call, he will bless you. I'm not talking about manipulated blessings. You know, have I ever come to you and maybe I cajole you so that you can give? No. I know, and I'm not trying to undermine you. You are doing your best. You are doing what you can. God bless you indeed. But there has been no, we've done great projects here. And no time did I ask, did I manipulate anybody to give? I will announce it. This is what we want to do. And go and sit down. Before you know it, five million, one million, five hundred thousand. After two days, three days, what we need is either the money comes to the ministry or the money comes to me. And the moment it comes to me, I know it is for that work. Strange 10 million just comes to me. It is, is, is going there. Strange 20 million just come. It either comes to me or it comes to the ministry. And we put it there. Anytime we have a need, I don't have any property anymore. Until that need is met. Before I can say I have money. Before I built that small house, we built the tent. Before I built the other one, we built this one. If, we, if God doesn't have a place, I, would, I don't need a house. I don't need, I don't need a house. And I will bless you. There will be an evidence that there is an allocation. My second trip to South Africa, a family just called me. If you go to South Africa, there's one estate. That's the best and the most costly estate in the whole of Africa. You need to be, it, that will be your closest, it will give you an idea it, it, that if earth is like this, how will heaven be? That is the closest idea of heaven on, on earth that you will see. You need to see the trees, the lawn. Jesus Christ. And you are walking on it. Tongues will flow from here. Second trip to South Africa. Then a family calls me and says, the Lord said we should give you something. So there, we enter the estate. That's an estate that you use, they use fingerprints to open the gate. If you are a resident in the estate, your biometrics is in the system. You, you, you touch it like this, the gate will. There's no estate like that in Nigeria. Not even Banana Island, because I've, I've stayed there. Echo Atlantic, I've, I've stayed there. We entered the place. They brought us to one side. And the people said, this is your house. It has swimming pool. I have not entered, I've, I'm still, see, we've gone to the house twice. We've stayed there twice. I, I, would, I didn't enter the swimming pool because I'm still wondering, is it true that it's our house? I, I couldn't enter. I did not pray for it. I did not ask for it. I did not manipulate the people. They had their own encounters. Then when we were in the house, everybody was sleeping. I now woke up and said, God, what are you doing? If we are not there, it's locked. The key is in my bag. The moment we come, they open it. They send us a cleaner that cleans the place. My only job is to lie on that bed and speak in tongues. I oh my God. Kabodo boko koleanama. Pastor Dan, under those circumstances, tongue will flow. It will flow. If you come to South Africa or you have any business there, I give you the key. You'll be amazed. He say, I will bless you. Stop running from pillar to post. See, God might, God, God may have told you, 
stand as an intercessor. Be foolish enough to obey it. Right there in your cupboard where you are hiding, if you are faithful, blessings will come to you right there. We went to the back, saw the swimming pool. They had filtered it. It was blue. One room downstairs. How many rooms upstairs? Three or four. And you need to stand on the balcony and just watch the beauty. If you have people with mental problems, put them up there. When they see the whole environment, they, they will be. And I will bless you. I will bless you. When I left the oil industry, everybody felt that was the best thing God could do. Serve Jesus. I no longer have respect for money. I can give my last dime if Jesus speaks to me. My last dime. And I've done it many times. Emptied my bank account. Pushed the money into the ministry. I've done it many times. The more I do it, the more the frequency of the, the frequency will increase. Or if I sow any amount to my father in the Lord, it takes 24 hours for it to come back. Doesn't matter the amount. And I've done this for more than seven years. 24 hours. So if I need to multiply money quickly, I just send it. 24 hours. There are some people that have something on them. And they have something on them. 24 hours. If I just need, maybe I need, there's a project and we don't have money. Even this one, they were building. I said, do you people want money? Send five million there. That's how this one came. I want money. Uh, I won't ask you. What I have, I wait for 24 hours. What I gave will come back, and then it will just be coming. Let me tell you something finally before I sit down. If God gives you money, and the reason why I gave you money is because of this. If you use the money to buy this, it will stop flowing. It may never pick up again. You didn't hear me. I said, if God gives you money, and he gives you the money because of this, don't buy this. If you do, the flow will stop. There is no formula that I know on earth that can reawaken that flow if you lose the alignment needed to keep it flowing. If he gave you money because of something he's doing and you squander it, it will stop. It is still worship. He's giving you money because of the things he's doing, not because of you. So you keep pushing it. A time will come, he will not ask you to push again. Then you can do your own. You can buy what you want. Sometimes you may even have money, and you are going to buy something. He will stop you and say, ah, where are you going? Go back. So you carry that money and go back and keep it. In three days' time, he will tell you what to do with it. I will bless you. And the reason for which you are blessed is not because of you. It's so that you can be what? A channel. We we'll fast and pray, then the anointing will accumulate so that you can be a channel. Fast and pray, the healing grace will come so that you can be, so your calling is going to make you a custodian of blessing. So things that should come to other people will come to you, not because it is meant for you, it is meant to be given out to them. You become a distributor. 
And if you are faithful in it, you'll be growing. The moment you decide to hoard the things God gave to people and you hoard it, ah, even the grace will not go on your life. Have you given 50,000 before? Have you given 100,000 before? You know what it feels? You know, and when you give 100,000, nothing happened. Have you experienced that before? You are, not, you are not answering. So I will not be, I will not. When you start sacrifice, it will not speak instantly. In fact, the fact that you gave, Satan will come and, and beat you in the night. To intimidate you not to continue, become rascal. A time will come, anything you touch will turn to gold. We were to travel somewhere, so we went to Ghana because the, the tickets from Ghana were cheaper. So we stayed over in a hotel and traveled. So Philip was to travel. Philip, my son, was to travel. So he went there, and they put him in that hotel. So the owner of the hotel and his wife, they just came out of the lift, and they met them. So he recognized our pastor in Ghana. He said, hey! You people stayed in our place? They now ask, is this your place? They say, yes, we own this place. They say, you own this place? Not, they put me here the last time. Hey, you, you brought him! So it's free for us now. If I pass there, now it's free. So that's why we will not pass there. They were building one hotel at a beach in Ghana. We went there to retreat, to pray. To... So I was walking on the beach. So the manager of the new hotel now asked, is this that preacher we watch on? They say, is he more? He now called our pastor and said, anytime that guy comes to Ghana, he's free. It will be difficult for us to go back now. Have I told you the story? Where four missionaries going to the UK. So I said, okay, don't pay for a business class ticket for me. Pay for economy so that four of us can travel. I was in the economy cabin when the air hostess came and asked my name. I had put the sleeping goggles because there were two women. I was sitting in between two women. I was just like this. May the Lord give you understanding in, in this matter. The air hostess called me. I said, is this your name? I said, yes. I said, carry your things. And they moved me to business class. Every opportunity God has, he shows me that I want to bless him. You know the way, you know jet lag and all those stress, traveling, then you now come back. A pastor forced me in Lagos. We came back to Lagos. Forced me to preach for him. So I was tired. I didn't pray. Just came to the pulpit like this. And I began to pray for the sick. That's how they brought a blind man. The man started singing. I, it was no prayer. I didn't pray before I went. The man started singing. His son brought him blind. They brought him with the hand like this. He entered into the place while I was praying for miracles. His eyes opened. He started singing. He started shouting. Started shouting. We lost that service. Then I went to the room and said, Hey, where are you? <laughs> Serve Jesus. Don't allow people to distract you. I have seen the goodness of God. I have seen the goodness of God. I have seen the goodness of God. While I was in the university here, only after my dad died, only one of my aunties ever believed that I had a need. 
And she didn't have anything. Only a small young farm in Boko. My auntie that married the thief man. So used to send me yam. She did not know that those yams were the school fees of her children. Because when God began to help me, I ensured that anyone that wanted to go to school, any level, I will bless you so that you can do what? The first thing you need to do now, right now, before I leave this stage, is to repent because of the way you trivialize your calling. We finished preaching in Cuba. People, the guy that was in the front opened the window and people were throwing money in envelope. So I told him that I don't receive money like that. So the ones he has collected, it belongs to him, but he should wind up that window. That's not how I receive money. For me to collect money from your hand, eh? God knows you. So it's not as if we go around asking people, no, no, I will not even collect. I will not collect. The, the guy thought I was joking. He said, no, 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 these people you collected, I can't collect money from them. I can't. Until we reached my lodge, he now realized that I was serious. God has provided all things for me. So it's only that which God approves that will enter into my hand. I don't need an invitation. I don't need to be endorsed. They say, this is a good man. A calling will make you, give you the status of being what? A blessing. Can we pray and say, Lord, help us not to trivialize your instructions. Help us not to trivialize your instructions. He said, cast not away your confidence, for therein lies a great recompense of reward. If a servant of God, if you decide that this, my body, will not be available for sin, God will take note of your commitment to purity. And he begins to make a plan for you. Oh my God. I will bless you. And I will make you a blessing. And indeed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Help me not to take your instructions lightly. Help me not to trivialize the things that are the desires of your heart. Help me. Help me to know that which will give you pleasure. Talk to him. Make me quick to respond to you. Make me quick to obey you. Teach me how to be a blessing to others. For it is written, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Help me not to lose my path. Help me never to lose my way. <laughs> Elohim and Adona H to H you're still the same 
by the power of your name you shall die you shall die Elohim and Adonai I will praise and lift you high Shaddai God can take care of you <laughs> Shaddai Elohim and Adonai Each to each you're still the same by the power of your name Elohim and Adonai is to it, you'll see the same by the power of your name. Elohim, Elohim, and Adonai, I will praise and lift you high. Oh, I shall die. Oh, I shall die. You shall die. Elohim and Adonai It's to it you're still the same By the power of your name